I really so appreciate how the Lord moves by His Spirit and creates an atmosphere that uh, really is uh, appropriate, a segue even to His Word and what He wants to speak to us. And I pray we open our hearts this morning and that we receive what God has for us, amen, and that uh, we will leave changed and we will leave healed. We will, leave, we will leave delivered. We will leave more like him. That's really what it's all about, isn't it? And so a couple weeks ago, we were sharing about the effect and the power of yokes, right? And uh, both negative and positive. A yoke can be good. Uh, a yoke can be a blessing. A yoke can be uh, a cursing. And we said a yoke is no joke. Well, I want to add to that. A yoke is no joke and must be broke. <laughs> I'm going to finish the equation, right? A yoke is no joke, and it must be broke. And God's word is very, very clear that it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. And we've been in a flow. God's been speaking to us. And there's something that's in my heart I want to share with you this morning as we continue in this flow. And I see it going on for uh, at least the near future. And so I pray it blesses you and encourages you. Now, I think the question we all need to ask ourselves is, Lord, I know I have a measure of the anointing. I know the Spirit of God lives in me and dwells in me, but what is it that I need to do? I'm so practical. I, I'm like practical. I love revelation. I love prophetic things, but I, I want to see it. I want to see it line upon line. One, two, three, A, B, C. Show me how to do it, Lord. And so um, I think that there should be a cry in each one of our hearts, Lord, we want to break these yokes. And I know I have the anointing, but what is it that I need to do? What is it that you're requiring of me that I might possess this level of anointing, this anointing that does break these yokes? Not only that I might be ministered to and delivered, but that I might minister to others. Amen? And so the, 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 the anointing is with us, right? If you're born again and you're saved, then the Spirit of God lives in you. The Spirit of God dwells in you. We have the anointing, and there's many ways we can see increase come to the anointing. M many ways. Someone can lay hands on you, right? There's called the impartation. You can receive spiritual gifts by the laying on of hands, and someone can impart that gift, that anointing, right? And there's, you can receive a greater anointing just by being faithful in your prayer time. Praying, seeking God, uh, praying in the Spirit, right? Uh, th this is all ways that God can increase the anointing in your life. Fasting, that one thing we also enjoy. Amen. By just soaking in the presence of the Lord, you can, re you can feel and you can receive a greater increase. Uh, being under the, the, the preached or taught Word of God, because the Word of God cannot return void. When the Word of God is preached, and you have a heart that's open to receive it, you will receive the impact. You will receive that word. Do you know another word, we a way we receive the anointing? Is when we're simply in place. When we are where God calls us to be. When you are where God called you to be, you are within a corporate anointing. You receive, amen, from your brothers and sisters by just being in place. Because the Bible tells us that we are joints the give and release supply one to another. That's why it's so critical to be in the church God called you to be in. You've got to be there so you receive what God has for you. You receive and you give. What does it say in Psalm 133? How good and how pleasant it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. There God commands a blessing. It goes on to say it's like the anointing on the head that flows to the beard. It flows down the garments. When we're in the right place, we're recipients of that corporate anointing. Hallelujah. And I know that's something that all of us so desire. And so all of this is so vital, but we need to understand we're after something more. We're after a specific expression of that anointing, and that's the anointing that breaks and shatters yokes. And I want to show us uh, very, very clearly that there's a process. There's a process we must give ourselves to if we want to possess this kind of anointing that breaks yokes for ourselves and, of course, for others. Look at Psalm 92.10 real quick. Look what David said. <clears throat> but my horn you have exalted like a wild ox 
I have been anointed with fresh oil. I pray that's what you say every day. Amen. Just, Lord, exalt my horn. That means authority. Exalt my horn. I'm asking for fresh oil. How wonderful. Every day, fresh oil. Before I came to church, I was before God. I picture, I imagine the horn of oil being poured upon my head and down my body. I say, God, anoint me. Anoint me with fresh oil today. Not yesterday's oil. Today's oil for what, Lord, I need today. Amen. There's fresh oil. What did David say in Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. Then he said, thou hast anointed my head with oil. How wonderful that every day God could give us something fresh. Now, Jesus is our example, right? Jesus is our example in all things. And uh, we, he's the pattern son. As we examine his life, we have clues. We have understanding of how we can walk like him, how we can be like him, how we can fulfill ministry like he did. And it's really interesting because the Bible tells us uh, Jesus, uh, he got in line to be water baptized by his cousin John, right? Can you imagine how that must have been? John's baptizing folks and all of a sudden there's Jesus, his cousin. Lord, wait a minute. I can't, I can't. There's a principle. There's a principle here. He was willing to submit himself to a the ministry of a, a lesser ministry of another man. Now that's a real principle that we won't get into. But he he didn't say, "Well, you, I'm greater than you." And you know, he just said, "Hey, I need to be baptized by you, right?" And so when he went into the waters of baptism. We know that he came up out of the waters of baptism and the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove and the Bible says he was filled with the Spirit. Wow. And then it says immediately, immediately, right after that, nothing in between, immediately the Spirit of the Lord drove him into the wilderness. And he goes into the wilderness for 40 years and is tempted by the devil, tested in his flesh. He went through trials and tests that you and I, we couldn't imagine the stress, the attack, the heaviness. And when he went through his 40 days of testing, the Bible says he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. He got filled with the Holy Spirit when he got baptized in the spirit at the water, but he got filled with power and he went out with power after he went through this process called the wilderness, 40 days. 40 is the number of testing in the scriptures, right? The children of Israel were 40 years in the wilderness and didn't even make it. 40, right? And so every one of us are going to go through seasons. We're going to go through seasons where God's working in our lives to process that anointing to take us from just being filled with the Spirit to moving and flowing in the power of the Spirit, the kind of power that sets captives free and breaks yokes. So I'm not sure, but is your time 40 days, 40 months, <laughs> 40 years? It's all different, amen? It's all different for everyone. Very important to understand. Now, in this day of transition, I believe God's transitioning the church from attention on an individual's gift and an individual's anointing to the corporate anointing, the anointing of all of us coming together. There's something so powerful. I don't think we really understand the power of coming together in God's unity and purpose in his divine placement and being one in him. Do you realize that every one of you are a note from God. A note, N-O-T-E. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, something like that. But we're a note. You have an expression, a sound, that is so unique, it's unique to you, and no other person, come on, on the foundation of the earth has ever had your note, your sound. It's beautiful, wow. But we realize it's not until we're willing to take our note right and allow the composer the master composer to take our note and place it in juxtaposition put it right in the order he wants us to alongside other notes to create a melody to create a song listen you have a wonderful note you have a wonderful sound but it's not till you say lord take me place me where you want me in your score that I might be part of your composition that I might become part of the song of the lord 
And when we're in that place, there's a song, there's a melody that breaks forth that's so unique and wonderful. Do you know that you're a word from God? Jesus is the word made flesh. We're sons of God. Every one of us is a particular word from God. No one is your word. Nobody that's ever been on this earth and created by God has the same word you have, has the same expression. Maybe you're a noun, maybe you're a verb, maybe you're a, and now we're getting deep. But you're a word. You are a word from Almighty God. Jesus is the word made flesh. And as wonderful as your word is, you know where I'm going. He's the author and the finisher. And when we allow him to take our life and place us with other words, according to his arrangement, we become a sentence. Then we become a paragraph. Then we become a chapter. Then we become the Lamb's book of life. Then we become a message that people can read. Whoa. So often we've thought the Lamb's book of life was a big book, you know, in heaven. And the Lord said, I don't know. Let me see if I can find your name. What's your name again? I don't know. Maybe there's a Lamb's book. I think the Lamb's book of life just happens to be his story being told through his body. As we all allow him as a word from God, you're a great word, you're a powerful word. But when you let the author put you next to other words, we become his story. That's why Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said, you're a living letter. You're a living book. And by the way, we usually say that about someone's life, true, but he was speaking about the corporate church. He was speaking about them as a body. And he's saying the way God has put you together as a church, you are a living book that people read. Don't you, don't you want our church? And God's working on us. He's the author and the finisher. He's putting all us together as words, in sentences, in paragraphs to make a story that only we can tell, that only we can tell through our own testimonies. Did you know that you were a stream? Every one of us have a stream, we're a particular stream, a flow. Your flow is unique to you. Your flow is different than my flow. But there is a <laughs> river whose streams make glad the city of God. And when we allow the Lord to bring our streams together, we become the river of life that flows into the city. It sets the captives free. Can I bring it to one other place? You have a vessel of oil. Every one of us have a vessel of oil. And when we come together and we bring our oil, when we bring our anointing together, that we are greater corporately than we are individually. Always remember, the corporate anointing is greater than any single man or woman's uh, individual anointing. Amen. Now, let's look at this. Isaiah 10. This is the scripture that we've looked at. And we're going to revisit and just refresh. And then we're going to share something. And it shall be in that day that the burden of the Assyrian shall depart from your shoulders and his yoke from your neck. The yoke shall be destroyed because of the fatness. That's strange. Which prevents it from going around your neck. <laughs> oh, Lord. Now, so important. This is such an often quoted scripture, right? The anointing destroys the yoke. The anointing destroys the yoke. Yes, it does. But you've got to understand in context what it's saying. This anointing is called fat, grease. Strange, right? We talked about this. It's the fat and the grease anointing that destroys the yoke that, that is full of power. And so just as a very quick review, a yoke... Remember, a yoke is an instrument that binds two things, two entities, two people. Uh, you know, in the natural, a yoke is a, a wooden crossbar with two, you know, neck uh, pieces or whatever. And they, they slip the neck of the oxen and the two ox plow together because two is greater than one. Usually it's a strong ox with a weak ox or, a, or a, an older ox with a younger ox. But the whole concept is that uh, you're yoked to this other, come on, entity, and you move and you flow together. And so a yoke can be good or bad, right? It can be the greatest blessing. If you're yoked to the right person, and you're yoked to uh, a, a, a another worker or, or servant in the Lord or the right mate in marriage, then it is the greatest blessing. And if you're not yoked properly, it could be a real difficult situation, right? And you wonder why you always have a pain in the neck. I'll leave that there. 
when, 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 if you're yoked with someone, they're always going this way, what does it do? <laughs> Not good. But when you're yoked together and you move together, flow together, complement one another, and you strengthen one another, hallelujah. And so in this particular scripture, and in most scriptures where we see yokes, it's negative. It's something that's stronger than you and I are. It's not beneficial. It's not desirous. And we're incapable of breaking it. We cannot break it in our own strength. Yokes of drugs, additions, perversions, discouragement, heaviness, depression, uh, perver you know, there's as many yokes as we can begin to imagine. God does not want us to be yoked, and that's no joke, right? He doesn't want us yoked, beaten down, pressed. If we could see one another in the spirit realm, if we had the eyes to see, we would see one another oftentimes just bent over and pressed down and heavy and just struggling no matter what it looks like. It's the, it's the proverbial monkey on the back. Do you know when Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden light. Do you know what he was referring to? He was referring to the law, the yoke of the law. Because the Pharisees, they tried to put the law, right? The heaviness of the law on the people. And Jesus rebukes him and says, you hypocrites. He said, you're trying to put the yoke of religion and the law on God's people when you yourself can't even bear it. And that's when he said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And my yoke is easy. He was speaking about grace. He was speaking about, come on, yoke with me, yoke with my grace. My grace is sufficient for you. It'll give you rest. Aren't you thankful for that? And so whatever we're yoked to, we have surrendered to and we serve. It becomes a God. It becomes Lord unto us becomes an idol. It's something separating us from God, and it ultimately will drive us and pull us and lead us where we don't want to go. It's very, very, very serious. And so, what are, what are, what are you yoked to today? We've talked about this. What, we're breaking yokes. We're breaking yokes. And as we just read, it's the, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's fatness. It's grease. We need to understand what that means. We can just go around and say, hey, the you know, anointing breaks the yoke. Hey, brother. No, no, we need to understand the anointing, the fat, the grease breaks the yoke. It shatters it. It just doesn't break it. You know the word means shattered, obliter obliterates. It just doesn't leave it, make you feel better for a little bit, make it go away for a No, it breaks it and shatters it and destroys it. Hallelujah. So it's critical that we learn how to operate in this anointing. I need to say something. I just, you know, uh, when I was sharing uh, two weeks ago about the yoke and being unequally, unequally yoked, I used as uh, uh, one reference, I talked about a, a marriage that's unequally yoked. And I, I, I have no, you know, apologies. I don't retract any statements I made. If anything, I could be stronger about it. It's very, very clear. Don't be unequally yoked in marriage. However, I meant to say something, and I feel I need to today, that there's times you are unequally yoked. Right? Right? I mean, I think it, uh, more, many, many, many times. It happens all the time. What if you, what if you marry someone that's a Christian and, uh, and uh, they backslide on you? What if you uh, were both not saved and one of you gets saved as you're living and serving God, you're unequally yoked. Hmm. What if you just made the wrong decision and you weren't listening to God and you just did it anyway? You're unequally yoked. Amen. I've heard people say, you know what? I just need a divorce. Uh, I'm, I, I, I married out of the will of God. Well, I tell them very quickly, well, now you're in the will of God. <laughs> and make the best of it. And God's still with you. Yep. And here's my point. God is with you. Amen. Even if you find that self in, you find yourself in that situation, whatever the reason, amen, the Bible says stay, remain. And the Bible says that the unbelieving spouse is sanctified because of your covenant with God. And it means that God has, he's working on that person. He's working overtime on that person because of you and your prayer and your right standing. Amen. 
I still believe, come on, I really believe strongly in household salvation. And if God saved one, he's going to save the other. And oftentimes God allows that so he can work patience in us. <laughs> Teach us to seek the Lord. Right? And it says, and your children are holy. What? The children are holy unto God because of your faith, regardless of your spouse. That's why Peter said, listen, he goes, ladies, if you want to win your husband, don't do it with the adorning of gold and purple, but with a sweet and gentle spirit. Yes. Interesting. But my point is this. God's with you. God's even going to work in you in the process. Trust and believe God. He's a God that saves households. Amen. Now, the anointing. The word means fat, grease. It's not the word found in other places where you see the word anointing. Other places you see that word and it speaks of a perfume. It's what's made in the apothecary. It's uh, cinnamon and myrrh and aloes and it's olive oil. And it was the ceremonial anointing that they poured on the head of kings and, and priests. And so that's a whole different word for the anointing. This word is very specific. It says the anointing that breaks those yokes off of our lives is from the grease, from the fat, all right? Now, let me share it this way. In the Old Testament, they would take what they call a burnt offering, and they would take a calf, they would take a bull, they would take a lamb, and they put it on the altar, and then they put the fire to it, and the fire would consume it, and the Bible says that it became a sweet-smelling aroma. It rose up as an aroma to God, and it pleased him, and it blessed him. God loved the smell of the bacon frying. How many like the smell of bacon frying? How about a sirloin grilling on the... Come on. And the Lord says, I like that smell. Now, it's interesting. The priest got to eat. The priest got to eat the offering... But God smelled the grease. Ah, that smells good. So what does that mean? When you and I, here it is, this is the crux of it. When you and I are obedient, when you and I in worship will bring what God asks and requires of us and lay it on the altar as a sacrifice and give it to him, whether it is a habit, whether it is a sin, whether it is an idol, whether it is anything that we have allowed to come between us and God, whatever he would say, I want that. And we're willing to take it and lay it on the altar and be consumed by his fire. It produces the grease. It, produce, it, it, it produces the fat, which then becomes the anointing upon our lives that gives us the power to break yokes. And let me say this, sometimes God asks for things that aren't bad. Sometimes he asks for good stuff, even stuff he gave us. Abraham. Abraham, I want the son. Yeah, that one, the one I promised and gave to you miraculously. I want you to put him on the altar and sacrifice him to me. Aren't you thankful God's not into sacrificing children? He tested his heart. He had no intention to take that son. Sometimes God is saying, take your dream, take your vision, take which is most precious to you. Are you willing to lay it on the altar? And I, I'm just telling you, if you're serious and you're trusting God and you're running after God, at some point he's going to ask for it. That's another message in itself. Lay it on the altar and give it to God. God sends the fire. It's painful. It's costly. But it produces the grease, the anointing. It produces the anointing in your life that gives you the power to break yokes. Back to the original text. Remember what was going on here? Assyria had taken over Israel. God had warned Israel time and again, guys, guys, wake up, guys, you're going, you're backsliding, you're, you're, you're worshiping other gods, you're not living right, you're breaking my commandments. He sent the prophets to warn them. And finally, God said to them, like he will say to all of us, he said, that's enough, I'm going to allow the judgment to come. Mm -hmm. I'm going to allow the judgment to come. The Assyrians came in and took them captive, and it was horrible. 
But what happened? In the process, they began to repent. They said, God, forgive us. What have we allowed to happen? We have turned our hearts from you. Oh, God, now we see clearly. Forgive us. We cannot endure uh, the, 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 this, this oppression and what's come upon us. And what did they do? They built an altar and they repented. If my people who were called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked way. Come on, church. It's no different whatever society or culture you're living in. And because they cried out to God, what they did was they took all those sins and all those things that grieved God, they put it on the altar and said, we surrender, God, forgive us. And God said, now my indignation will arise, and now I'm going to give you an anointing that breaks the yoke of oppression. It's not just somebody coming up to you with anointed hands and saying, your yoke is broken in Jesus' name. God can use those things. Oh, but he's taking us to... Oh, dare I go there? No, I won't. This nation has a yoke on it. This nation has a yoke of oppression on it. It's going to get tighter and heavier and more burdensome if the church doesn't wake up. That's all I have to say about that. As, as far as Gump would say, well, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Now let's bring it down to where we live. It's going to get a little tight, but it's good. Every one of us have been through things in life. Every one of us have been through experiences in our life, whether you're 80 years old or you're 18 years old. We've been through abuse. We've been through rejection. We've been through hurt. Maybe it's physical, spiritual, emotional, sexual. There's not a person that has not suffered an injustice. Somebody hurt you. Somebody wounded you. Someone did a, violated you in the most intimate or personal way, whether I said in the emotion or the physical or the spiritual, and it had a great effect upon you. It happens. Life happens. And then we come to Christ. And we experience his love. We experience his mercy, his compassion, as he pours his love deep into the innermost part where we got wounded and hurt, and he heals us. Aren't you glad he just not only heals our physical body, he heals our emotions. He gets down deep into that place, that recess of hurt and wounding, that place that ha has become a, 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 a stronghold, a yoke in our lives for years and years. He comes and he heals Oh, thank you, God. But then he comes to that place where he says, I want to go deeper. I want you to get delivered of the victim mentality. I want you to get delivered from the need to get revenge or to have hatred or to in any way have a negative connotation or in any way uh, 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 looking back, look down against that experience or to hide it. He's saying, I want you to bring it all out, bring it all out, the perpetrator, the one that offended you, the injustice, all that you've been through with it, I want you to lay it on the altar and let me consume it. That gets a little harder. It's okay, Lord, when you just minister your healing. It feels so good to be healed in my inner man. Yes, he's a balm in Gilead. But he comes to the place and says, I want the offense. I want the unforgiveness. I want where you have held them in contempt because you are the prisoner through it. And I want to do more than just heal you. I want to set you free. And when we are able, and it hurts, but when we're able to say that father, that mother, that sibling, whoever it is, that teacher, that per whoever it is, God, I lay them on the altar. I give you all of this and lay it on the altar. I release them. I forgive them. And I'm asking you, God, to heal me and to heal them. That's when you're moving in to a realm. That's when you release the oil, the grease, the fat that gives you the anointing then to go forth and not only break that yoke that's been in your life, to be, be, but to be the one that breaks other people's yoke. It's a costly anointing. 
It's saying, Lord, I've been offended and I've been hurt. It's affected my life and I have every right to hold that person in contempt. I have every right to have anger in my heart. As a matter of fact, it's therapeutic. It's how I deal. Don't touch it or mess with that, God. It's when you can say, I'm taking the hurt, I'm taking the, 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 the transgression, I'm taking whatever it is that affected me, and Lord God, I'm laying it on the altar, and I'm asking you to cause it to become love, compassion, mercy, grace. I need the grease, I need the oil of forgiveness, because it'll set them free, and it will set me free. Isn't it interesting? How somebody can pray for you. People can pray for you, and you, they're praying to break this yoke. Oh, come on, help me. They pray for you, and maybe you feel a little touch. Maybe you get partially delivered. Maybe you feel a little relief, but it comes back. And then another person, a total different person, comes, prays the same prayer, uses the same words, and you get powerfully delivered, and that yoke breaks off of you. Why? Because that person has what I want to call a qualified anointing. That person has the grease. They fried their bacon. They have the grease. They have the anointing to set you free because it first set them free and they have a compassion for you. Your ministry is where you got set free. Your testimony. Your testimony is so powerful. Your ministry, where you're anointed, where you break yokes, is where you have had your yoke broken, you have laid it on the altar, you have the grease and the oil to go set other people free. That's why we need one another. My God, we so need one another. And when we come to church, we have a yoke-breaking anointing. We need to hear your testimony. We need to hear where you've been, what you've been through. We, want to, we need to know where you're fat, greasy, and where you have fried your bacon. <laughs> Amen. Come on now. Now, it's the power of redemption. How good is God? How good is God? I tell you what. You might say, well, if God's so good, why did I go through this? And why did that person violate me when I was so young and harmless and innocent? And why did I go through this? And why did I go through that? And why does God allow evil? Because we live in a fallen world. But here's the good news. Here's the power of redemption. God allows all of that. We are a product of our own choice. Sometimes it wasn't our choice. We're victims. We are. But that's what causes us to cry out to God. What causes you and I to cry out to God is when we've been in tough times, when we've been hurt, when we can't figure it out, when there's been violation. That's the way God allows us to just break out and call out to him, and that's how he reveals himself to us. He reveals himself to us because we've been through trials, tribulations, adversity, hard things. And then we realize how awesome he is. We begin to realize, oh my God, you love me. If I wouldn't have gone through this, I would have never experienced who you really are. And then, if that's not good enough, we're talking about the power of redemption. He then says, now you go take what you receive and go give it to others. Now that's redemption. God's got a plan. It's everyone contributing to the pot. It's like all of us coming together and we all have a little anointing thing. Sometimes you carry this little oil, remember that? That's still good, I mean. Everybody brings a vessel of oil with them to church. Wow, that's exciting. And then we allow everyone, come on, to open up their oil and to begin to pray and minister to one another. Wow. You're ministering out of your oil, your grease, your fat, what you've been through. When we gather together, like this morning, it was a beautiful time of worship. When we gather together and worship God, we are all bringing something corporately to the house that probably no one else understands what we've been through, the hurt, 
the wounding. But when we say, Lord, nonetheless, it's not about what I need. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to love you. I want to tell you that's an aroma. That's a burnt offering. That's a sacrifice of praise that arises to God. Ah, oh, man, something cooking down there at Eastgate. Man, that smells good. I'm smelling their bacon, right? Come on. Wow, that's good. Anybody can praise the Lord. Praising the Lord is thanking him because good things are happening, right? Lord, I just want to praise you because I got a great job. I got lots of money. I'm in my health. My kids are good. Great. Praise the Lord. He's worthy to be praised. But worship is when <laughs> you got a flat tire on the way to church. You can't afford to pay your bills. You got a bad doctor report. Worship is when you can stand and say, Aha, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. I'm going to lift up my hands and I'm going to worship him. I'm going to worship him in my broken place. That's the worship he is drawn to. That's why the Bible says they that are fat <laughs> worship God. Spiritual heavyweights. You're not a spiritual heavyweight because you can quote a lot of scripture and you've got titles in front of your name. You're a spiritual heavyweight because you can worship God. You can worship God in the midst of the fire. You can worship God when everything's falling apart around you. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. But I'm going to worship my God. We make the mistake of counting sheep. God weighs sheep. I want to be a fat, heavy sheep. Come on. And when that heavy, when, when, when we worship God out of that broken place, we are producing the oil, the anointing. Corporate anointing comes. And God wants to begin to speak and, and God wants to minister. I'll touch base with that in a second. But look at this. Look at 2 Kings for a moment. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, Well, that's all right. Well, well your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Wow. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Don't just gather a few. In other words, get all you can find, right? And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you, and your son shall pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. He said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons live on the rest. Isn't that beautiful? So important. Here's the key we have to see. The oil, that little bit of oil in that widow woman's vessel, it wasn't oil produced in the apothecary. It wasn't the anointing oil, right, with the perfumes in it. It was grease. It was grease. It was, it was what was left for her frying her meats. And it was valuable. That had value to it. You could sell that. It's no different than you go into the market. You go to Market Basket and you get frying oil. What's it called? Crisco oil, stuff like that, right? So it had value to it. It's, and that's important. What she had in her, oh my God. What she had in her vessel was a little bit of grease, fat, oil. And there's a lot of ways we could go with this, but I want to make a simple point. And that is this. Here's this woman She's in dire straits. She's in debt. They're coming to take her sons to pay off the credit. My God, rough group. Well, that's, the, that's those days, right? The man of God comes, and he gives a pretty strange directive. And the word of the Lord is, go gather all the vessels you can find. Go to your neighbors. Bring them all into the house. Close the door. Close the door in the house. That's another message. Bring them all into the house. And then what did he tell her to do? Take the little bit of oil you've got in your vessel and begin to pour it. Begin to pour it. It made no sense, but she was obedient. Come on. 
And she began to pour that little bit of oil in what we just read. My God, as long as she kept pouring the oil, as long as she kept pouring it from vessel to vessel, it replenished, it multiplied, it kept pouring, and it did not stop until there were no more vessels to fill. Wow. And she had so much oil. She could cook. She could pay her creditors. And she had enough to live on. How powerful is that? Church, every one of us have a measure of oil in our vessel. You've got oil in your vessel. I've got oil in my vessel, right? And the key is simply this. When you begin to pour out of your vessel to someone else, it replenishes, it increases, and it keeps flowing. You've got something someone needs. When we come to the house of God, we need to bring our vessels of oil. It doesn't matter. You may say, I feel like I've just got a little bit. Start pouring and watch what God does. Someone needs a word of encouragement. Someone needs a holy hug. Someone needs a prophetic word. Someone needs a scripture. Someone might need a hallelujah handshake. You know what a hallelujah handshake is? When someone shakes your hand and there's a $50 bill in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've got something that someone needs in the house. And the key is just give out that simple thing that you do have and watch God bring the increase and watch it begin to flow. That's how you grow in the anointing. Really anointed people, it just doesn't be because they got some special grace. They've been faithful. Be faithful in little. God will give you more. If you're faithful in the little, start small, but just give, serve, bless, and watch God fill your vessel to overflowing. Keep pouring out, keep giving, and the anointing increases, and the anointing flows. My Lord. You see, church, that's body ministry. That's what we desire. That's our goal. When we come together, we worship, we praise, there comes that place where we become mature and, and we become sensitive and we begin to realize, I've got something to give you. You've got something to give me. Do you realize I can't give you a lot of things that others have in their vessel that can give you? Oh, yeah. Don't look for me to give it to you. I might not have it. But the person sitting next to you, they're the ones that probably has it. And God does it that way on purpose so we don't depend on one person. I have a gifting to teach or preach or to lead the church, right? Uh, I just have a portion. Uh, I'm called to be like a facilitator to direct spiritual traffic because God calls overseers. And, and, but I need what you have. You've got something I need. Yes. Rebuke that devil. Rebuke that lie. Well, what do I have? You've got what somebody needs. Yes. And when we come together, we've got to fry our bacon. Good Lord, we've got, to, we've got to pour out and share and minister to one another. Watch the increase. Watch the blessing. Uh, the key to it all. The key to it all is the power of redemption, as I said. And we must guard against offense, unforgiveness. <laughs> what breaks this whole thing down is we're, when we're not living in right standing one with another. Because Satan, come on, he attacks this through offense, unforgiveness, resentment, envy, accusations. That's why the Bible says, give not the devil place. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, nor give the devil place. In other words, oh my God, place, topos, topos, Greek word topos, topography. Don't give the Lord any room in your life through anger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, or you invite and give place rightful place, legal right, for the devil to come in and get a stronghold. And the more you do it, the stronger the hold becomes. And it becomes a fortress. It becomes a yoke. God help us. Resentment, anger, unforgiveness, offense will kill the anointing. We've got to respond Christ-like and lay our hurts and wounds and offenses on the altar. And let God consume it. Do you know a healthy church, you can smell bacon frying all the time? Really? 
How do you bring people together different than one another and not have to fry bacon once in a while? What am I saying? Offense. Unforgiveness. The devil, it works overtime to pull us apart and hurt us and, and, and put lies in our brain about people and like, accusations. Once in a while, you got to go to someone and say, hey, let's go get a bacon sandwich. Maybe even a BL and T. <laughs> Once in a while, you got to say, you know what? Time to fry some bacon. Hmm. That's so true. That's so true. Remember, God's chosen fast to break yokes. And then he goes on to say, oh, yeah, but by the way, one prerequisite. There's one yoke you must break or none of this works. Break the yoke of the pointing of fingers, accusation, criticism. If you've got that in your life, God's not hearing a thing you're saying. He's not receiving your praise. Go back, go back and get right with your brother before you bring your gift to the altar. Because we're either yoked to Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren, or we're yoked to Jesus, who is the intercessor of the brethren. Come on. Now, pulling it, pulling it at the end here. When Jesus appeared that resurrection night, walks through the walls, and there's the disciples. Can you imagine what a scene? Hey, guys, it's me. I'm alive. The rumor's true. Why did you doubt Marion? And what did he do? He showed them the scars and the wounds in his hands and his side. He was saying, listen, I'm carrying in my glorified body the scars and the wounds that I suffered for all mankind through all eternity on this beautiful, glorious body. I will carry this in my being. That's how heavy it was. And then he said something. He said, receive the Holy Spirit, remember? And he said, whoever sins you whole will be held. Whosoever sins you remit will be forgiven. That's heavy stuff. Jesus' authority came from his willingness to forgive those who wounded him. Oh, my God. It's so interesting. We want to learn the techniques and how to say the right cliche to release healing. And God is saying, I want to teach you how to forgive and fry some bacon. You want that anointing? Yeah, there's a certain way to pray. There's a certain procedure. Sure there is. But there's something deeper that God's working on in our hearts, right? When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. He had full authority over every devil and demon, every sickness and disease. Why? Because he forgave the ones that wounded and hurt him. And in, what does it say in, in communion? It says, do this in remembrance of him. He died for you. We are remembering what he did. That's why we have to make sure we have right standing with God and one another. Right? We're remembering. The thief said, Lord, remember me. In Aramaic, it means put me back together again. Hmm. Lord, put the church back together again. That ought to be the cry of our heart. Put us back together in right relationship. But the point is this. What gives you the authority to heal and deliver and move in that power and break, break yokes is not your Bible school degree. It's not how many scriptures you can quote. It's not how long you've been in the church. Do you operate and live in forgiveness? Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, that even though he was the son of God, he did not, come on, he did not make himself equal to that, but he emptied himself, took the form of the servant, right? Humbled himself even unto death. Therefore, God has exalted him, given him a name above all names in heaven and earth. He's our example. And our authority comes when we walk in right relationship one with another. And forgive when we've been hurt. Forgive when we've been wounded. Take it to the altar. Cook some bacon. Get some more grease. Come on. Are you hearing me? If you've been offended, forgive that person. Dead people don't get offended. I don't know a dead person that ever got offended. <laughs> Are we not dead in our sins? Dead in our flesh? 
How powerful. Look at the examples in the scripture. Abraham, he had this knucklehead nephew. Remember Lot? He should have never taken with him. He should have never taken him with him on, did I say something wrong? He should have never taken Lot with him on his journey of faith. He was a pain in the tush. He did nothing but get in the way. Cause him heartache. Then he ends up living in Sodom and all the things he did against Abraham to offend him and hurt him. It was the prayer of Abraham that brought deliverance to the knucklehead. How about Moses? Who can come against Moses, right? Who can lay a charge against Moses? And yet his brother and sister come and say, what's with the Ethiopian chick? Right? Were you real marrying an Ethiopian? And God looked down and go, whoa, don't you ever touch my man and who he marries. And he turned her into a leper. I mean, he, he, got, he got upset. He was wroth at them. And who was it that said, no, Lord, forgive them. I don't hold this against them. Forgive them, Lord. Who prayed for their deliverance? The one who got offended. How about Job? Good Lord. Job, all those things came upon Job because he was a righteous man and God was proving his heart that loved him. And so here he is in an ash heap, lost everything, catastrophe after catastrophe, and here comes his three <laughs> friends. Friends? If friends like this, who needs enemies? Well, Job, we just came to minister to you. Apparently God's mad at you, and you got hidden sin, and you're an evil dude, and on and on and on and on, right? Thanks. They got sick, and it was Job who prayed for his friends. Well, where do you want to go? What about Joseph? His half-brothers throw him in a pit. Kill a guy. We're jealous of him. Go tell his father, oh, an animal got him. Yeah, 20 years later, there's famine. Come on, his half-brothers show up in Egypt, and he is, come on, he's number one dude after Pharaoh himself. He's running the whole country, and there are his half-brothers who betrayed him, hurt him, and he wept. And he said, what man meant for evil, God turned for good. And he prayed for them and blessed them. Wow. Wow. Paul, who do you think you are? Going around like you're something, some big shot in the church. He could have said, well, I wrote two-thirds of the Bible, the New Testament. He could have said, well, look at the miracles I do. Look at all the churches I started. He said, I bear in my body the marks of Christ. I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been wounded. I've been, I've been you know, talked about. I've been maligned. I've been, yeah, 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 yeah. Church, can I ask you this morning? What hurt have you experienced? What wounding have you experienced? Who has spoken against you? Who has hurt you? What life experience have you had that has just tormented you? And God says, lay it on the altar as worship. Let's make a little bit of bacon grease. I'm going to use that thing to not only heal you and give you authority, I'm going to give you the anointing and the authority to set people free. Wow. God help us. Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. Isn't that interesting? I thought one day, what good is a fly? Of all the worthless creatures God created, flies. Really? What are, they, what are flies for? They torment you, they buzz around you, they bite you, they spread disease. They're just a type of a demon, that's all. <laughs> but do you know that flies are drawn to open wounds? Demons are drawn to open wounds and offenses. And then they spread it. The devil would rather wound you than kill you. If he kills you, big deal. If he kills me, big deal. If he wounds me, then I'm going to wound others. God is asking his people to build an altar. It's so powerful. 
That's how we get this anointing. No offense, no offense, no offense, no offense. Amen. Abraham built an altar, put five men or a beast, but God didn't show up in his timing. What happened? The birds tried to come down and steal it. He had to stand up over the altar and rebuke the birds. It doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes you've got to stand over your offering and you've got to rebuke stuff. Oh. I close. Danny, would you come, my brother? I'm going to close with a testimony. You probably heard it before. I don't know how you can be part of the church and not hear some of this. But it always comes out different, and I pray it ministers to your heart. It happens to be something that I did right. Because I'm not one to draw back and testify of things I've done wrong if it helps you to learn. I think you know that. Do you know it's tough to be a pastor? I was on the phone with Genia last night for two hours. God bless my brother. Sharing with me, <laughs> sharing with me, the people don't like who I married. I said, brother, he's the most precious, wonderful woman that brought balance and strength, blessed his heart. Well, let me share a few things about that. <laughs> people are talking and people are going to other churches and visiting and talking and then they're bringing back this guy. Anyway, pastoring's tough. I believe it's one of the highest callings there is on the earth. And that's why there's a special crown set aside in heaven for those folks. Because what makes it hard to be a pastor is not so much the training, not so much Bible school or seminary or all the things you've got to go through. Because if you're going to be an effective pastor, you should be able to do everything in the church. Not... not you're a jack of all trades. Like I've told you, I've done everything but the clown ministry. Not my anointing. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but here's the point. Your training is not in academics so much or experience. It's the school of hard knocks. You're signing up for God to take you through every kind of challenge, situation, people in life go through so that when you sit down with someone, you don't take out a textbook and you don't just give them a scripture, but you say, let me tell you where I've been. And boy, pastors go through the school of hard knocks. Grief, all right, I can talk to you about grief. Broke, no place to, okay, let's talk about that. Rejected, ha, ah, sure. In other words, you've been through these experiences, God, brought you through these experiences so that you're just not dispensing some kind of knowledge. You're sharing a heart. I've been there. I fried that bacon. I can help you. And all of us are called to pastor to some degree. Your experiences in life are invaluable. But here's my story. And you've heard I went to, I got saved radically great, two years looking for a church, went to a Pentecostal church, denominational, charismatic, Episcopal church, all that stuff. I heard a guy on the radio, five minutes, and I went, my God, I'm hearing something from this guy that I haven't ever heard in my life. And, I, and I, so my wife and I went to this church called Rock Church of Baltimore. There was about 20 people there in a Knights of Columbus hall. And I'll never forget, I walked in and the pastor is up there leading worship. And he goes, I can, uh, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now there is no condemnation. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. I can... And, I, and so he looked at one and I went, <clears throat> good Lord, get me out of here. What have we walked into? What do you think? 15 minutes later, I can run. Yeah, because we let down our intellect, our guard, our pride. Just said, my God, it feels right. It feels good. I need this. And then 
I made the mistake of going to the pastor afterwards and said, I love the church. How can I be a blessing? <laughs> and for the next 18 years, it did everything in the church. And probably, honestly, beyond balance. Just crazy. I was so blessed from a, from a, from a deacon to an elder to an assistant minister to assistant pastor to the senior pastor with 500, 750 people, brand new building. I got to start churches, preach, uh, lead Bible school, counsel, lead worship. I did everything. I was blessed. He would say to me, you do more than most senior pastors ever dreamed of. And he was right. But it had its challenges. And I was being trained up to take over the church because my pastor came from the mother church in Virginia Beach. And Bishop John and Ann Jimenez, what a church. The Rock Church of Virginia Beach, I believe with all my heart, was the prototype apostolic church in the 80s and 90s. Everyone respected. They're the ones that God raised up to bring the whole body of Christ together in Washington for Jesus. They were, they were the first in everything. It was wonderful. I'm proud of my DNA, my heritage. And so he was being trained up to take over as bishop of the whole network, and I was going to take over this local church. And then it happened. And I was pastoring for a year and a half. I never really won my thing, but I was obedient. You know, I just, my heart was always to come here. One day I got that call. No, it didn't work down here. It wasn't timing, and, and I knew what was happening. There was head button, and, there, and, and, the, and the bishop said, enough of this, go home. And he came home with a vengeance. And everything that was happening good was because he set it up, and everything happening bad is because I messed it up. It sounds like politics, right? <laughs> Leave that alone. But he came back, and I went from preaching five times a week, doing all these things, to working on the new building six days a week, day and night. Oh, yeah. Just with people coming to me constantly. You're our pastor. You're our real pastor. This isn't right. You want to talk about a dilemma. You want to talk about a test to the heart. And it got so bad, I said, that's enough. I can't take it no more. I don't care what it means. I don't care if I'm going to be a stonemason the rest of my life. I don't care all that I've worked toward. I can't do this any longer. And my wife and said, said, I said, that's it. We're going to march right into his office and tell him we quit and we've had it. You've used us. You've abused us. Well, we had a week off right before that time we were going to go tell them off. And we're down Ocean City, Maryland. We're driving, and we look over, and there's a brand new Christian bookstore that opened. And we say, hey, let's check that out. We go in, and I say to the lady working there, hey, you know, I'm a pastor. Whatever, I don't know. Any good books to recommend? And she said, as a matter of fact, I do. And she goes and gets the book by John Bevere, The Bait of Satan. And she said, this really helped me. <laughs> all right, sure. And it was all about, it was all, and you know, most of, we've had studies here. It's blessed all of us. It may have even saved your skin. Listen, it's all about the scandal. The devil's trap is a fence. He puts the cheese of a fence in the trap, sucks you in, come on, and then kills you. A fence kills. I remember going home, back to the apartment there, and I opened the book and I began to weep. And the Spirit of God hit me so hard. God saved my life. God saved my call. Now, I mean, I, God will work things out, but it was God. Talk about repentance and weeping and crying out. We decided we're going to go back and just assume our position and be sweet and overcome. We're not falling in this trap. So we went back a day earlier. We were due back at work on a Monday. We show up on church on a Sunday, not expected. And there's a guest speaker there. Her name is Mary Ann Brown. She was the, one of the most powerful prophets I've ever known. Powerful woman of God. She just read your mail. And she rhymed. When she prophesied, she prophesied in rhymes. Good Lord. We're sitting in the back. You guys, come on up here. Oh, good Lord, what's going to happen now? You know what she prophesied? 
she said, I've watched you in the trials and in the adversity. I've watched you in the afflictions. And you did not take your sticks. You did not take your sticks of brokenness and attack. But you laid them on the altar and worshipped me. This is before everybody. And she said, therefore, I'm sending fresh fire from heaven. The fire of Pentecost is going to come upon your lives. And I'm going to send you to your heart's desire. And you're going to burn for Jesus. Within a month, I was on the way to Ukraine. Then on my way here. And God set the whole thing up with honor and blessing. Because God kept me from falling in a trap called unforgiveness, offense. And then she said at the end, I'm going to give you a testimony and you will testify. You will testify that I'm the God that gives beauty for ashes. What you thought was ashes, brokenness, no hope, offended, used, forgotten, I'm going to make it beautiful and it'll be your testimony. And I can testify one of the reasons I'm standing here today is the grace of God that he kept me from falling in that trap. And once in a while, lots of times, he brings me right back to that place and says, oh, oh, remember, don't go back there again. You may say my life is ashes, but I'm here to tell you he's going to make something beautiful. Can he be that awesome? Can he be that involved in our life? Remember that song? He made something beautiful, something good. All my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful of my life. Is that your testimony? You think he doesn't complete what he started? You might have every right to take those sticks and attack. Lay him on the altar. Fry some bacon. Get ready to watch God move in your life in a way you never dreamed. Will you watch God's anointing come on your life? And you will become a redeemer. You will become a healer. You will become a deliverer. You will become a man or woman of God without guile who trust their God to fight for them. God will fight for you. Can we stand? I don't have to be a prophet to say there's not a person in this room that God has not spoken to in some way. And I don't want to touch anything holy or precious. But before God, if you've got something to lay on the altar, someone to lay on the altar, this is your opportunity to just say, Lord, thank you for speaking that word to me. The very thing that I've allowed to torment me, that has become an enemy to me, it's what I can hand to you. It's what I can place on the altar. And you release to me your anointing, your love, your mercy, your grace, your call, your purpose. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to fight for it. You talk to God. When I consider what God puts up within me and how I am worthy of judgment of Almighty God, who am I to point a finger 
at any other person. Lord, work in me so deep your nature, your love, your mercy. I know it hurts, but God, you're releasing a yoke-breaking anointing into my life. And I'm going to pour it out and bless everyone you bring to me. <laughs> we can have a conference and a seminar and someone can come in and teach us how to lay hands and rebuke devils. It's good. It's good. <laughs> teach you my ways that's the easy part I want you to qualify so father in Jesus name we stand here in your presence thank you for your presence your anointing that's been in this service thank you for every every hurt every offense that's been laid at your altar this morning Now, Father, we're going to leave this place. And every day, we're going to arise and go forward so aware of this powerful truth. We lay down our offenses, our hurts, unforgiveness, resentment, whatever it is. And we're going to carry in our vessel the anointing that breaks the yoke. free 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 <laughs> thank you Lord thank you Lord 